So I haven't done one of these since 2019. Mostly that's due to the world being a trash fire in the past decade and a video like this feeling less important, especially around the mid-year. At the same time as a creator, I have this weird thing of not wanting to give away too much for the eventual year-end video. I worry that if my picks don't change, I'll have just wasted material too early in the year, and I enjoy keeping things a little bit of a mystery for all of you guys out there. But the thing is, a lot can still change in six months. Last year, my match of the year didn't even get locked in until the very last days of the year, and just in general, there's a lot of stuff left on the wrestling calendar that can shake things up. At the same time, I feel like this is the first truly full year of the decade, where for the most part, people are working full schedules, promotions are running at full strength, and there's an actual sense of competition and a bustling industry in the air. That doesn't necessarily mean that things have been better quality-wise, but it does mean that there's been more to see. And just through the sheer force of statistics, that means that there's more greatness to celebrate as well. So today, I'll be going through Event of the Year, Promotion of the Year, Tag Team of the Year, and then five picks each for Match of the Year and Wrestler of the Year. I'm only taking into account wrestling that occurred between January 1st and June 30th. By the end of June 30, I'd have seen 723 different matches from 2022 across multiple different promotions. Significant blind spots of mine include most of WWE Weekly Television, most mainstream Lucha Libre, and most of Stardom, All Japan, and NOAA and pretty much the entirety of the smoldering remains of European independent wrestling. These blind spots can be either incidental or intentional. I do try to have as much variety in my year-end awards as possible, but just looking at what's happened in the mid-year so far, this is by far the most narrowly concentrated year I've covered since starting this channel. I am hopeful that this can still change by the year end as I expand the length of the lists and more material comes to light. I won't be going into too much detail with all of the entries here as I go through them, as I still want to save a more in-depth analysis for the end of the year. Plus, many of these picks I've actually already written about in other places, especially over at Fanbyte. So check out my work over there if you're interested in some more detailed breakdowns of 2022 wrestling. With all that out of the way, let's get into the year's best of wrestling in 2022 so far. No less than a top three pay-per-view that AEW's ever run. Their other pay-per-views this year peak much higher, but this finally had the timing, pacing, and cohesion that I've been lacking from AEW events for quite some time now. This is your classic case of over-delivering thanks to an incredibly weak card on paper. Luckily, outside of the IWGP title match, nothing on this show was bad and it was helped immensely by having a great main event and a red-hot Chicago crowd. The easiest AEW pay-per-view to watch since last year's All Out, and maybe even stretching that out further to Revolution 2020. I wouldn't call this a slam dunk lock for this category though. Even in just the first few days of July, there are some very strong contenders to take it down. So there's definitely room for change at the end of the year. At the moment, I don't love this pick for promotion of the year, as the Forbidden Door pay-per-view cycle left a lot to be desired from AEW. Even beyond that, I feel like we're at the tail end of a couple of months now of 
uneven television from this company. Paired with the injury bug that's been going around, I think AEW has a shaky grasp on this title going into the latter half of the year. That being said, my god, the peaks that this company reaches. It's a question of talent, really. Not since mid to late 2010s, New Japan has it felt like all the very best performers in the entire world have congregated in a single promotion. Because of that, every episode of TV, every major event, you're almost always guaranteed at least one great match each time out. I'm not head over heels for AEW, but their successes are just so hard to argue with. However, let it be known that there are many, many promotions nipping at its heels. One may yet still catch up to take the throne by the end of the year. Duh. I'm sorry, but there's really no other reasonable pick for 2022. The Briscoes had a strong start of the year, but AEW Corporate's refusal to utilize them has stunted their momentum yet again as they are relegated to places like Impact or the indie scene. Perennial contenders such as the Astronauts and Violence is Forever are saddled with less than ideal opponents or they're just being given a reduced focus as a team in general. Meanwhile, FDR make tag team wrestling feel important. Not since the Young Bucks in Reseda have a tag team felt like such a distinct main event attraction, specifically as a team. And each and every time they go out to perform, they make it look effortlessly excellent. Not to mention that FTR had the best tag team match in North America since Revolution 2020. And if I'm being honest, I probably like FTR versus the Briscoes more than I liked the Young Bucks versus Hanger and Omega. This is an uncontested category this year. I truly would not expect any change by year end. It's a rematch to the 2021 match of the year, and of course, it's still incredible. I don't think this quite reaches the heights of the one-hour draw, but what they choose to do instead stands on its own incredibly well. The match is about Hangman Page sealing the deal after coming oh so close to beating the greatest of all time back in December. We see a much more aggressive Hangman prepared to weather the storm that Dragon brings and push his way through with pure ferocity. Also, blood! Can't go wrong there. FDR's Statement Match of the Year The team had already begun to recover from the stumbling blocks of 2020 with a low-key strong year in 2021. Their matches against Sting and Darby stood out as a neat return to form for FTR, but it's in this match against the Briscoes when they transcend their own reputations and attain an entirely new level of brilliance. This is a wild match, from the brutality of the strikes to some of the nuttiest bumps you'll see all year. Tag team wrestling this good just doesn't happen in North America anymore. FDR and the Briscoes brought it back, reinvigorating an entirely neglected genre of pro wrestling in the mainstream landscape. Wheeler Yuta's career match against the most important professional wrestler in the world. The final step into the Blackpool Combat Club, in the words of John Moxley, is one of bones cracking like thunder and blood raining. Yuta puts in the performance of a lifetime as an aggressive, pumped up babyface ready to go the extra mile to earn Moxley's respect. As for Mox, well, he's the guiding hand orchestrating the violence. He is a brutal, 
force of nature putting Yuta through the ringer. That Yuta endures, survives, and even thrives against Moxley here shows why he's earned the respect of the hardest men in pro wrestling. A true star maker of a match. The best match from Japan all year. Nothing in the mid-year from Japan has come close to the kind of punch that this packs. Wall-to-wall action executed by two of the finest wrestlers in the world. The brutality in this is beyond compelling. Irie is such a convincing heavyweight bully with offense as dazzling as a second rope Samoan drop to as simply disgusting as a gruesome shoot headbutt. It's the latter that really makes me cringe and squirm when I'm watching this match. Lindemann, for his part, puts in a belter of a babyface performance, perfectly conveys being the undersized but determined challenger struggling for survival. Long live the strong hearts. Good triumphs over evil in the most decisive and conclusive way possible. The MJF character up to this point was built to eat shit, and my god does he eat shit in this match. That's a compliment in case that wasn't clear. This match is everything that MJF as a character deserves. It's the fulfilling of his destiny. All of it done with swift and gleeful violence by our hero, Wardlow. Who the hell needs moves when you can do power bombs instead? Wardlow lang ang malakas. Bailey's wrestling like he's making up for lost time, which I suppose he is. With his visa issues in the States finally cleared up, he came in hot this year to make a statement and show everyone in North America just what they'd been missing without him around. It all really starts with the banger against ACH early in the year, and he's been on a roll ever since against the likes of Cole Radrick, Konosuke Takeshita, and Lee Moriarty. Babyface or heel, TV or indie, North American wrestling is better off with Mike Bailey around. With Daniel Garcia fully cemented as an AEW roster member, Kevin Koo takes his place as the best independent wrestler in the world. Koo has been the centerpiece of the Southeast independent scene this year as the action champion as well as the joint tag champion of both SUP and action with his partner, Dominic Guarini. Koo's 2021 was already great, but it feels like he's gotten even better this year. His matches have been telling more layered stories, and he's gotten better at winning over crowds to root for him. He can be a dominant destructive force, he can be an undersized underdog champion. The sky's the limit for Kevin Koo, be sure to keep an eye on him. So I'll be upfront. If Danielson stays injured for much longer, this is a spot that he's almost certainly going to lose. He's still got a very, very good shot at making the top 20 at the end of the year, but unlike 2021, booking just isn't on his side this go around. He starts the year off strong with the Hangman title match and the match against Moxley on pay-per-view, but from there things cool off for the American Dragon. Don't get me wrong, there are still great matches like the wonderful Blackpool Combat Club squashes or Anarchy in the Arena or the young boy hazings against Garcia and Yuta, but one definitely gets the vibe that Dragon isn't at the center of many of these stories and happenings. That being said, his resume for six months is still very, very strong, and if he's back before the year's out, he'll almost certainly still make the top 20. But I will say it will probably be lower 
the number three. I don't care how many singles matches Dax Harwood gets to have, FDR are going to share their spot on this list because their achievements as a tag team are what matter the most. Not since the Young Bucks has tag team wrestling in North America felt so alive and major as it has with FDR at the top of AEW. Yes, Dax gets to show off as a singles guy much more often, and I'll be transparent and say that his efforts are part of the case that I'm building for these two. Dax got great matches out of Adam Cole and Will Ospreay, two acts that I'm personally not very high on in 2022. That alone puts him easily in contention for best in the world. But when Cash Wheeler's given the opportunity, which he usually isn't, he's shown that he's not far behind at all. Just watch the Jeff Cobb match from a recent Rampage as proof. And as a tag team? What even is left to say about that? The match of the year contender versus the Briscoes, the highly improved rematch against the Young Bucks, even their smaller indie efforts against the Wolves and the Rock and Roll Express. In 2022, the top guy's moniker has never felt more apt. When John Moxley came back from rehab, from the moment he opened his mouth on Dynamite, I thought to myself, that's the guy. That's the man that AEW should be built around. And while his first few weeks saw him work off some ring rust, the match with Danielson at Revolution awakened something in Mox. From that point on, Mox simply has not missed. The matches against Yuta, Deppin, Lawler, Bailey, the list goes on and on and on. All of that culminating in defeating Hiroshi Tanahashi for the interim AEW World Championship. Mox is in the lead, and he seems set to only continue adding to his case as the head of AEW, as well as through his various indie bookings. Mox feels unstoppable, and it'll take quite a Herculean effort to topple him from this spot. John Moxley, the best wrestler of the year so far, and one that will be very hard to catch. There you have it, everybody. My picks for the Mid-Year Awards in 2022. Of course, I will be updating this in January, once everything has wrapped up, I want to say thank you to all of you for sticking around until the end of the video, and an especially big thank you to all of my supporters over on Kofi. My thanks to one-time supporters like Nova, Misawa's Elbow, Theo McLeod, Alex Shelley Fan, but again, and Cheryl, and of course a massive, massive thank you to all of my monthly supporters in James Draper, Captain Jack Heartless, Eddie Roberts, Jacob Dickens, Matt Brummett, Chick Fritz, Spiders in My Bed, Timothy R. Buchner, Indelane. Don O'Matic, Peter Vinison, Kid King Pin, Joe Humphreys, Christopher Jackson, Saltine Dalton, Dustin Faulkner, Edgar Molina, Four Pillars of Hell, Sean Emily, Mason Rollison, Carve Cutta, Jacob VR, Andrew Perry, Craig Jones, Merch Table Mafia, Clem DK, Suit Coat Man, Ando Commando, Con, Shane, Vibe MD, Christoph, Quentin Besnehard, Matthew Haggerty, and Christopher Richards. You guys are absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for helping the channel out and supporting what I do here. You guys are awesome. Thank you for sticking around and have a good one. <laughs>